Hello, K1. Hope everyone is doing well today. Um, and we're getting closer to uh, getting together, as I said to you last week, and in an email, we'll start meeting again. Our first meeting will be on Easter Sunday. So bring a friend, come be excited to see each other, but most importantly, to see each other meet with God. I, I'm not gonna say that you haven't been meeting with God, but you haven't been meeting with God with everyone else. So we have an opportunity to come together and meet with God together. <clears throat> and so what I want to talk about today and I want to build on, I think I think I want to build on up to uh, Easter Sunday is this idea about um, familiarity with the things of God. And the title of today's message is Don't Box God In. Don't box God in. You know, oftentimes we have in our mind how we think God is going to do something. And most of the time, it doesn't happen the way we think. Um, God isn't sort of relegated to doing things the way we think He's going to do them. I mean, you think about this. God is... God is in, in charge of everything. He, he, he can control everything. So why would we limit him to what we think or how we think he's going to do something? Because the ways that he's going to do something are endless. They, they're just endless. We, we don't even have the ability to think through all the ways God is going to do something. Because, I mean, think about this. Uh, here's a good example. Jesus tells Peter, you know, they got to pay their taxes. Okay, we need the money to pay our taxes. I mean, who would have thought Jesus would have said, go down to the lake, throw your line in, you're going to catch a fish. When you catch the fish, the fish is going to have some gold coins in its mouth. Take the gold coins and go pay your taxes and pay my taxes. I mean, you, who, who would have thought of that? I wouldn't have thought of that. But I'm, I'm just, I'm saying the creative nature of God is so expansive that we can't box him in. And so uh, I want us to, to, to be thinking about how do I stay open to what God is going to do with us, K1, with you, a member of K1. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like you know, one of the things that I don't do, and I've never, never done, is I don't highlight my Bible. I know a lot of people do, and that's cool. I don't. And the reason why I don't is because what God is speaking to me today may be different than what he spoke to me yesterday. So if I highlight something today that God is speaking to me, when I go back and read that same chapter, that same verse, the next time, my eyes are going to be drawn toward that highlight. But God may not be speaking that to me today. He may be speaking something completely different to me. And because I'm focused on the highlighted portion, I don't glean what I need to glean for today. Right? That's the point. Is let's make sure we're gleaning all we can from God today. And let's not box him in to think, well, God did this in the past, or he said that in the past, or he moved that way in the past. So... Let's expect him to do the same thing again. Let's not expect him to do the same thing again. In fact, let's expect him to show up, but let's expect that he's going to move the way he wants to move, and however he wants to move, we're going to embrace. That's, that's I think, is the best way to, to sort of um, to, to view uh, the moves and the things of God. But I've got a couple of Stories. There's the same story in two different books. Um, this, the first one is in Luke 4, verse 14. Luke 4, verse 14 through, I think, 30. So it reads like this. This is the New Living Translation. It says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee. The title of this little caption is called Jesus Rejected at Nazareth, which is his hometown. 
Then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in the synagogue and was praised by everyone. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boy, boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on a Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked upon him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scriptures you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow, <coughs> excuse me, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. But the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue was furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They, did, they intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Okay, let's look at Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark, Mark is called the businessman's gospel because it, everything is shorter in Mark. I mean, everything. It's just probably this, one of the shortest gospels, if not the shortest gospel, but everything is shorter. So I'm going to sort of read the same story to you. Uh, Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus left the part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did you get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own friends. It's interesting to note that his, his brothers, his, his biologists, I guess his stepbrothers, the brothers of, that he had with Mary, uh, his mother, they didn't even believe in him at this time. Later they do, but at this time they don't. It says, and because of their unbelief, he couldn't do many miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Here's, here's the thing that's interesting about this story. That, well, there's many things I'm going to look at, but, but I want you to think about this. 400 years had passed between the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi and then Matthew. Between Malachi and Matthew is 400 years, essentially 10 generations. During that time, during that 10 generation period, that is called the silent years, there were no prophecies, there were no dreams, there were no visions, 
There was no, there were, God wasn't speaking to people. There was nothing. It was silent for 400 years. It's not until John the Baptist comes on the scene and then ultimately Jesus comes on the scene that the people actually are beginning to hear God speak through John the Baptist, God speak through um, Jesus. So what they had been thinking all along is that the Messiah was going to come and the Messiah was going to come and what would happen is that he would he would come like, like uh, the king of an army. And this king would overthrow the Roman Empire and bring the days of David and Solomon back to them. And this is how they were sort of thinking the Messiah would come in, 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 in might and, and in power in a, in a, in a worldly way, uh, with a kingdom, an earthly kingdom. Uh, they weren't at all thinking that Jesus was going to come the way he came. 400 years of silence. So here's what you have, is you have um, those in attendance when Jesus is, is reading this and speaking uh, about the, the, uh, the scripture he was reading in Isaiah. They're initially astonished at him and what he's reading and what he's, he's saying because his words are spirit. There's a scripture in John 6, 63, I think it says, Jesus says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So when he speaks to them, they're not just getting uh, 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 words that, that just can be heard, they're actually getting words that are alive because they are spirit. He says, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So when he's speaking to them, he's speaking to them spirit and life. And, and this is why they say, where did he get all this wisdom? Because when they hear these words, they actually come alive. And so it's just tremendous. And then what ends up happening is somebody is like, hey, wait a minute. This is, this is Joseph's son. This is Mary's son. This is, he's a carpenter. Yeah, he used, to, he used to deliver my newspaper, the Jerusalem Journal. This kid, this kid, remember him? He, this snotty-nosed kid, he's nobody. He's nobody. And then they were offended. The Bible says that they were offended at him. But let me say this. God will offend your mind to reveal what's in your heart. He will, he will, he will make you, he will make you, uh, make you see things from a worldly vantage point, from a lack of belief to actually reveal what's in your heart. He'll offend the mind to reveal what's in your heart. And so this is what's happening. So these these people who are in his hometown, who recognize him, who see that he's he's just. Joseph's and Mary's son, he's nobody, are offended at him, and they don't believe in him. So they have this familiarity with Jesus. The familiarity they have with Jesus is he's Joseph's and Mary's son. He's, he's the carpenter kid. He's the one who, who, you know, if you want some chairs and a and, and, a, and, a, and a table made, you tell him, he will tell his daddy and they'll fix it for you and then they'll deliver it to your house. That's who that kid is. That's, that's what he does. He, he's a carpenter. He's nobody. This is their familiarity with Jesus. And because they see him this way, and they don't see him as the Christ, they don't see him as the Messiah, they can't receive what he has to give them. I want you to understand that. When we don't see Jesus, when we don't see God the way he truly is, and the Bible, the Bible gives us revelation about who he is, 
when we don't see him that way, in the, in the broadest way, and we try to put him in the box, then we can only receive from him in the way that we put him in the box. If he chooses to reveal himself that way, he may not. And so all the other ways and all the other things that he wants to do for us, in us, through us, that don't coincide with our little box, we'll miss. We won't get. Because we won't believe that he's actually moving outside of the way we've boxed him in. It's, 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 it's tremendous. Now, we will never say, we'll never say we box God in, but I think we do all the time. I think we do all the time. Uh, if there's something that, maybe there's a promotion we want at work, maybe there is a car or a home or a relationship or this or that, whatever it is, we'll figure out in our puny little minds how we think it's going to happen. And we'll begin to look for things to happen in that particular way. And when things don't happen in that particular way, we say, God isn't moving. God isn't doing what, what, what I want him to do or, or what he said he was going to promise me. Only to come to the realization, hopefully, that God has so many other ways that he wants to move and can move. So, so why would we box him in to that? So we would never say out loud so someone could actually hear us, uh, I'm going to put God in a box and I'm only going to view God this way. We'll never say that. But I think we do it all the time. And what I'm suggesting is we just get rid of the box. We get rid of the, the framework or the perspective that we view God and, and how, he think, how we think he's going to do something in our life. Just get rid of the box and be willing and open and expect that he's going to do something bigger, better, and beyond we could ask, imagine, or think. That is what the scripture says. The scripture says that, um, that, that he will do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, imagine, or think. What's also amazing to me is this, in this Mark scripture, this verse 6 of chapter 6, says, And he, he, Jesus, was amazed at their unbelief. She, I mean, there's only, there's only one other place where Jesus was amazed, where, where the centurion who said, um, just speak the word, you don't have to come to my house. The Bible said he was amazed at the faith of the centurion. Well, he's amazed at this unbelief, at their unbelief. Meaning, he was expecting that they would have a greater level of faith and a, and, a, and a greater sense of belief in who he was. And so he was just amazed. He was scratching his head. How is it that these people don't really believe me? Well, because you're just the carpenter's kid. You're just Mary and Joseph's son. You're not the son of God. You're not the Messiah. And they were, not only, not only did they not believe him, they were offended at him that he was trying to convince them otherwise. Crazy. So in Luke, um, let's go back to Luke. Jesus, Jesus tells these two stories. <coughs> Excuse me. In Luke, Jesus goes to tell them two stories, one about Naaman, found in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was a military officer, a great military officer. He was from an enemy nation of Israel, so um, he fought against Israel. And because of Israel's belief in that time, 
God decided not to heal any, heal anybody of leprosy in Israel. And the only person that got healed of leprosy was Naaman. Not only was he not from Israel, he was of an enemy army. How about that? So Israel has a covenant relationship with God, and God doesn't heal anybody in Israel of, of, of leprosy because of their lack of belief. They are so unbelieving. Their hearts are so hardened that God decides to heal Naaman, who was from an enemy army. Isn't that amazing? This is how hard their heart were, was toward God and the things of God. And Jesus is saying, this is how you are, Israel, in his day. This is how you are. This is why they wanted to take him out on the cliff and stone him, because he knew they were talking about him. Your hearts are hardened. Your hearts are so hard that, that he couldn't even heal them, just like in, in, G, in, in, uh, in, uh, in 2 Kings, uh, when, G, when um, Elijah was trying, wanted to, when God wanted to heal the people of Israel from leprosy, he couldn't because of their hardened heart. I just, I just think that's just amazing. And so Jesus is saying, you're just like those people from back in the day. And he quotes them this story. Another story that he, he tells them is the story of the widow of Zarephath. Elisha, the first one was with Elisha the prophet. Uh, and then this is Elijah. Actually, the, the story of Elijah is first because it's found in 1 Kings chapter 17. And the story of Elisha is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. But the story of Elijah uh, with this, this widow of Zarephath, there was a famine in the land. And of all the people, of all the people that needed food in the famine, many of them were in Israel. But he didn't send Elijah to be fed by anyone in Israel. Why? Because of their unbelief. So God is going to do this miracle with this, this widow of Zarephath. Eli, the, the brook dries up. The ravens stop bringing him food. God tells Elijah to go to Zarephath because there I've already commanded a widow to feed you. So he goes to Zarephath. He finds this woman and he says to her, would you please go make me a, a piece of bread and get me some water? And she says, well, I only have enough bread to feed myself and my son and then we're going to die because we're starving to death. And then he says to her, first bring me the piece of bread and the, the oil that you have and the flour that you have will never run dry until crops grow again. So she does it. She brings him the, the bread he eats, and um, they eat off the oil and the flour until crops grow again. What's interesting about this story is that this widow is from a foreign nation, Zarephath. And so I'm sure there were, Jesus even says, there are lots of widows who, who uh, could have used some of that food this is verse 26. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, meaning in Israel. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet of Elijah. But God chose not to use Elisha to feed people in Israel. He chose to use Elisha to feed feed this woman in Zarephath who is from a foreign nation. Why? Unbelief. Unbelief will keep us off the cutting edge of what God is doing because we think he's only going to do it the way we've perceived he's going to do it. And so any other thing that, that God wants to do that doesn't look like what we think, we don't have faith for it. We don't believe in it. 
we don't we don't we 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 don't really care about it and that keeps us off of the cutting edge of what God wants to do in and through us today it keeps us from expecting God to to do mighty miracle signs and wonders and to do things on our behalf in a totally different way than than what we thought it's that, it's that unbelief that allows us, our, that, that, that gives us an inability to see God today. See, when we box him in, we box him in with a perspective of yesterday. We box him in and we think we're, that God is going to perform, he's going to do what he's going to do the way he did do it. And we can't box him in. We can't box him in into the, the way God has moved. We've got to see him clearly what he's going to do today. Not what he did yesterday. God is constantly speaking to us. Here's an a, a, a interesting and, and true but funny story. Remember God says to Abraham, Take your son, <coughs> excuse me, Abram. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, and go sacrifice him. I, the Bible says that Abraham gets up early the next morning. He and his son, he tells his, his servants, stay here. The boy and I, we're going to go worship the Lord. He ties Isaac up, lays Isaac on the, on the altar. The Bible says he, his knife is drawn. And when his knife is drawn, the Lord speaks to him and he says, stop, put away your knife. Now, if Abraham was only thinking what God had said, not what he is saying, Isaac would be dead. But he was expecting to hear God. And we've always got to be expecting to hear God. God told the, us a certain thing, but God can tell us a new thing. He can say something new to us today that we need today, that, that actually may be different than yesterday. It's not a contradiction in the Bible, but it may be something different that he spoke to me about my situation, about your situation differently today than what he spoke yesterday. So we've got to be able to hear God afresh today and not assume that God is going to speak the way he's always spoken yesterday. If we're not careful, familiarity can lead to unbelief, and unbelief can lead to us tying God's hands so that he can't do what he want, actually wants to do. See, Jesus, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus is seeing all these people, crippled people, people who had diseases and maybe leprosy and sicknesses that he's, he grew up with, and he couldn't do anything about it because his time hadn't come. But now, his time has come. He goes to, to Nazareth, to his hometown. And all these people that he had grown up with who, who've got all these ailments, all these maladies and sicknesses, he actually can heal them now because now his time has come. And he can't even do it because of their unbelief. And so their unbelief actually ties his hands, ties God's hands so that he can't do what he actually wanted to do. Isn't that amazing? Why am I saying this to you? Because I want us, when we start meeting again, I don't want us to revert to an old paradigm. <clears throat> I want us to come in with a fresh perspective. There are some things that's going to look the same. Probably some of us are going to look the same, uh, sound the same, uh, 
But let me tell you, spiritually, we're not the same. We're not the same spiritually. God has moved us spiritually. And so it's important that we keep our minds, our spirits, our, our spiritual hearts, minds, and ears, and eyes open for God to, to do amazing things in our midst more than what he's done in the past. We may be meeting in the same place, but that doesn't mean God's going to move in the same way. And I want us to have a very open and, and, and uh, perspective and heart for what God is going to do, what I believe God is going to do new in and through us. He's going to meet with us afresh and so I want us to be, be, be expecting that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are way bigger, way bigger than we can even imagine. That, that you actually can't be put in a box. We thank you that you are, 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 are bigger than our ways, that, that we, we can't even understand all your ways. But Father, I pray that, that our hearts would be open toward you, that our, our minds would be alert toward you uh, in the coming days, weeks, and months. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching this and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you'd like to, just pray this prayer with me. I repent from my sins, all of my sins, the sins that I know and the sins that I don't know. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of everything, Lord over my life. I believe in my heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I pray, Jesus, come and live your life in me and through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. All right, K1, be blessed. Take care of yourselves.